Good evening, everypony, and welcome to Commentary's Magic Stream on tonight, Sunday, September 23rd, 2018. I am, as always, Grand Paws. Our cat. And with us today, we have a couple of special guests. I'm Pirate Dash, and... And I am Ivory Starlight. We are glad to have the two of you here with us today. I'm glad to have at least one of you here. I'm still kind of lukewarm on Ivory myself. Wow, incredible. Oh, really? Come on. Leaves channel immediately, never comes back. Womp, no. Womp. No, it is great to have you both here. Uh, we are very excited. There's a lot of cool stuff we're going to be talking about today. Um, all sorts of tips and tricks and tools that can be used to help run successful tournaments or events for your local playgroup. But before we get into that, we have some news to recap. News? I thought it was old. But, um, Tish? Boo. Evidently not, I guess. Boo. I'm not, I'm not Pinkie Pie, the funny one. You are not. I, I make the bad jokes and puns around here, okay? Well, Actually, Silverquill does when he's here on occasion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Silverquill makes that one, I think. <laughs> Anyway, uh, what do we what do we got first here? Well, first, uh, just a brief reminder to everyone: uh, Coco number eight signups are due tonight at nine p.m. Pacific, so you've got just under two hours left. Um, sorry for the delay in that last week, but we wanted to make sure that people had plenty of time to sign up. So, if you have not submitted your decklist for this most recent core constructed online tournament, you may feel free to do so. The link is in the sidebar. You can also find it on Reddit and on our Facebook page. And several other places too, probably. But I'm yeah, sure you should if go you're... check that out, because this one's going to be really interesting. There's some neat stuff going on. Second, if you had forgotten in the last couple of weeks, Continentals is only a month away, and... Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I've never been so excited except for that one time when I was like, <gasps> but I mean, really, who could top that? We're Combo just, can top that. We're just going full Pinkie Pie here? We're just going full Pinkie Pie. Um, but Continentals is coming to Ponyville Cider Fest for the first time in just over a month. And that means that signups are going to be opening very soon. So keep your eye on Ponyville Cider Fest's website. They will have um, signups available through their Eventbrite system. We will also be accepting signups in person, provided that we do not get the full 32 person cap filled out online first. So if you're interested, you should probably reserve yourself a spot online in advance. Yep. Also, what news do we have as far as set did, 10 goes? Did someone say set 10? I, I heard set 10. I heard did set someone 10 too. say set 10? I heard it has a name. D does it? I don't know. Can you confirm or deny this? I can confirm this? Set 10 has a name! Yay! Yay! Friends forever. Unfortunately, there's still no news on the dice set. Oops. But, set 10. It's got a name. Sounds like it's going to be a thing. I don't know if you're excited, but I'm excited. Wait, we already did that joke. Dang it. Sounds like a perfect 10. Uh, I, I see. Wait, was that a Lyra joke? That was... I think just that a... was a Lyra joke. No, no, just a bad pun. I'm going to write that down as a Lyra joke regardless. That's fine. So 10 will be coming. Estimate is sometime in November. Hmm. Which means, you know, probably like February. Nah, I'm thinking November. Maybe December. Sounds about right. Yep. Well, that about covers the uh, news wrap-up for the last two weeks or so. 
So now that we're done with the olds, is that what you called it? Yes. Shall we get into the actual news news? I suppose. All right. Uh, as many of you may have seen, uh, Interplay posted a message on their Facebook page, um, letting everyone know that they were um, going to be providing us with some um, tools and support to help kind of lead play efforts with local communities and play groups. And this has always been something that we have felt very passionate about. And now we have the means to do stuff about it. Being able to meet up with players new and experienced with any kind of regularity is a lot of fun. Because as great as it is to connect with people online for this game, uh, sitting down and playing it in person is still, in my mind, the most fun experience you can have with it. The problem is that a lot of groups haven't had the communication with Enterplay or retailers that they need in order to be able to run their events. And that is where we are stepping in. We're going to share a little bit of information about the early plans we have to support local groups and play stores here. There will be more information that will be coming as details get worked out, but for now, this will at least get things started. Of course, the best thing that we can do to help support organized play is to figure out who's actually playing. And so, we have a questionnaire that we would like playgroup leaders or event organizers to fill out. That form is linked in the sidebar. We're going to be posting it in a variety of sources, including our Facebook page, probably our Twitter, Skype, Discord, the usual groups. We are interested in knowing what you're doing and where you're doing it at. So we have a better idea of how many active playgroups we've got all over the country and even all over the world. I've already filled it out, so... Well, we appreciate that very much. Note that there is no minimum requirement as far as number of players or frequency of meeting to fill out this form. If you have even one other person that you go and you meet up with at a local store or with any kind of regularity um, to play the game. We'd like to know about it. So we'd ask anyone who is involved in scheduling meetups, organizing events, running tournaments, whatever it may be, uh, to please fill out this form. Because one of the things we'd like to do is establish a network of people who are actively playing. and get kind of a geographic map of it because it is one of our goals to make product available to any group no matter where you are located through whatever means we have to. We know that there are several groups who have met up and continue to meet up that find it very difficult to be able to obtain product from local game stores, or those local game stores find it very difficult to be able to obtain product from distributors. And we'd like to try to correct that as best we can. So please share this with your local event organizer, if you are not them. Or if you are, please fill it up. Mm -hmm. Inform yourself that you need to do the thing. As far as more exciting concrete news for uh, future event plans, Ara, you want to tell them the next thing that's in the works beyond Continentals? Uh, how's the store championship sound? I haven't had those in... A long time? I don't know, because all I remember is the last time there were some vapor trailings, and fortunately that will not be the case again. But yeah... I... I think those were 
All right. What, what you got? What you got? I think those are classified as regionals. So I believe it's been, I would say, close to a couple of years the last time we had an official store championship round. So, yeah, it's been a while. But we're looking to hopefully get a set of those running. And the best way to get those to run is we need to know where your stores are. So there's some added incentive to get that form filled out. Mm-hmm. We're, I think, looking at early next year? Yes. Early next year, sometime after the release of Friends Forever. Give the meta a little bit of time to develop, people a little bit of time to get their hands on some cards. And then shake it up. That's the plan. No major tournaments directly after a set release? Well, I mean, everyone loved that Gen Con Continentals, which was, you know, two weeks after Rock and Rave. And everyone loved that other Gen Con Continentals, which was, like, three weeks after Marks in Time. Yeah, those were, those were great. I saw no problem. <laughs> Needs to be done again. Maybe not. No, let's not. Yeah. I'm gonna, go ahead no. and, I'm gonna go ahead and pass on that. But yes, store championships in the works, uh, as well as other fun events as well. Um, we will, of course, have more specific information to announce for that in the coming weeks. But for now, this will hopefully be an incentive, like Ara said, to fill out that form and get us some info. Now, okay. so, just on the odds that you don't have a structured environment already kind of working, we're interested in giving you the tools that you need to set a structured environment up, specifically by, and as the stream is titled, How to Tournament. Now, I have myself a, a great long rant here that used to be a 5,000-word document and is now cut down to a mere 2,000-word document, and quite frankly, I still don't know if I'm going to get through the whole thing in one shot. But before I sit here and rant at length at you, we have Pirate Dash and Ivory, who are two notable players who have their own playgroups, and they have some tips for you. So we're going to give them a little bit of time to share some of their wisdom and experience. Uh, Pirate Dash, you want to take the floor here? Sure, I can do that. Um, and actually, before I begin, I do want to mention one more thing about Continentals and Cider Fest. I do want to congratulate you guys publicly for being community guests for Cider Fest uh, this year. That's a huge honor, uh, most definitely. And congrats on getting that. And thank you. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of want to start my bit with a little bit of a backstory. I've basically been playing this game literally since the start. Um, I missed the first. Uh, pre-release, which was the premiere set, only because I had to babysit that weekend, but ever since then, I've been playing. Uh, I played, my first place I played at was a store called Dice Dojo in the Chicagoland area. It was a great group. We had some great players there. We got 10 to 12 people every week uh, for just a brand new game. A lot of fun. Um, but it, it was a long drive for me. Um, not, not only was I working third shift at the time, but if I had to work on a Friday night into the Saturday morning, I'd, I basically would have to sacrifice sleep just to get to the meetup and make the three-hour drive to the store. So while I was able to do that, it wasn't feasible in the long term. Fast forward to when I moved and got my second radio job, I moved to a new town, and we just – I needed a place to play. I needed people to play with, but going up to Chicago was not feasible because that drive was actually longer. Now it, a three hour drive turned into a three and a, or a four hour drive actually. So I figured I have to get something local here. Um, in the town I lived in Galesburg, I reached out to the store owner there. Um, he was, he was fine with it. He wanted to demo the game and we actually did there. Um, but one of the things I did was, I set up a big demo weekend across stores all over central Illinois. We started with a store in Peoria and that store in Galesburg. Uh, we brought a couple people up from St. Louis to help us out, and we got some healthy turnout for that. Uh, we, I did some heavy promotion on that. I posted in the Reddit. I posted on Facebook. I posted in Brony Facebook groups like, hey, we're doing this. Come on down. Come play. 
and we we got some good numbers for that. Uh, not everyone stuck around, but we started to build a core base there, and we were able to grow little by little. Um, and that, that's basically how the Central Illinois MLP CCG group started. Um, I needed a place to play that was closer, more feasible, and there were people around that wanted to play. And we just started meeting up uh, each week. One of the big things for our group in the early days was just having store owners that were very supportive for us. Um, not only did we eventually uh, grow in Peoria, Galesburg kind of tra trailed off, but we found a great store in uh, Bloomington that would also help out with us. And they were very supportive. They would give us table spaces. They would give us whatever we needed to kind of promote the game. Uh, the store in Peoria even let us live stream on their store stream for a couple weeks. Uh, so th that was that. You've got to build some good relationships with store owners to kind of help your group and kind of help it grow. That That's one important thing you got to do if you want your group to be successful. Get those store owners supporting you and having your back. Um, despite all this, the one thing that I knew that our group needed to kind of grow and get better was we couldn't just sit around and play casually. We we had to be competitive. And by that, we had to get some store championships and we had to get some regionals in our uh, stores. Not only was it good for us to be competitive and to have a good player base here, but it would bring in other people too. At our first store championship, uh, we had people from Milwaukee come in. We had people from St. Louis come in. People were coming to our little store in Peoria because we had that store championship. And pe those people were starting to find people to play with. Um, so getting those store championships and eventually a regional at our store in Bloomington was really great for not just our group, but for growing the game in general. Uh, I believe in our last regional in Bloomington, we had, I want to say 15 people there, which, which, which is pretty strong numbers. Um, and then not only that, um, not only do we stay in our stores, but we also go to other stores as well because it's all, all about networking as well. I, we'll probably talk about in a bit. We didn't just stay there. We went to Indiana. We went to Green Bay. We went to St. Louis. Just like, hey, we're playing. Come join us too. So that's how we've been able to grow and be strong. And um, even though it's tapered off a little bit, we're still a tight-knit group and we still get a chance to play. And it's honestly a pretty good thing. Cool. Glad to get that insight into your group's background. That sounds Thank like, you. Actually, that's a very interesting uh, method of getting the word out there. I bet we probably have some players who'd be more interested in that. Which method uh, are you referring to? You're, um, I believe it's, it's referred to in the chat as barnstorming there. Yeah, that that's the word I would use for it too. Just um, because we know our group is spread out wide, we have we have players that come into our stores from Chicago, Wisconsin, Minnesota, St. Louis, uh, even Indiana as well. And those we kind of those are pretty significant drives. They are. They interstates kind of help, but not by much. But to kind of help and show that appreciation for them coming to us, we also go out to them and to kind of show off our group as well. And it, it doesn't matter where we're at. We will show like, Hey, this is our group. This is our Facebook group. Come join us. Um, and about the Facebook group, I it's, we all know Facebook groups maybe have like 10, 20% of its users be active at the most, but we have I, 40 people in our uh, Facebook group. And I, I'd say that's a pretty strong number for just a pretty small group. Yeah. All right, cool. Ivory, give us a little bit of a background of uh, your experience as a TO. Sure. Well, my history with the game starts in the Seattle group, and I learned to play with that group. And due to circumstances, I was pulled back to the East Coast. Now, Seattle was definitely one of the larger groups at the time and so i was definitely itching to find a new group 
I ended up finding a tight-knit group down in Richmond, Virginia, who played at a store called One-Eyed Jacks, and they were more than happy to have another person on board. And we, it, my first event there was the store championships, and from there I attended their weekly locals. And as time went on, after the regional of 2016, I believe, um, due to shifting management of the store, we ended up uh, relocating to a different store uh, across town called Battlegrounds. Now, this store, in between the move, our TO decided to step down, and me, along with another local player, uh, took over. And at that point, we decided to take things into a more regular tournament-based direction with weekly tournaments from Harmony. Uh, at the time, it was block format, as well as limited format at least once a month, whether that limited format be draft or popper. Now, Pirate Dash touched on the importance of being in contact with the store owner. That is huge, because if the store isn't on your side, then well, you're going to have a bad time. But another important thing to keep in mind is when you're running a play group, it's important to be in communication with your players because different players want different things out of the game. And it's important to, although you don't want to do casual free play every week, it's still important to include tournaments for the competitive side a good balance between events i think is very important and it allows all sorts of players to try out different decks different strategies and to play against different decks now one other thing to also keep in mind is some because the game is small some players may have to drive pretty far to get to the events so occasionally why not have some games at people's houses we've also done that as well and it's actually drawn pretty consistent numbers in the past so there's a lot of different things you can do with your play groups and open communication between players and tournament organizers is definitely the best way to go about doing that Great, perfect. All right, well, thank you guys. We're glad to have you here. And now that we've got kind of a background from each of you, hopefully uh, most of you are familiar enough with um, Sim's background or our activities at various conventions and tournaments that we don't need to go into that again. What's Sim? Um... Uh -huh. <laughs> so without further ado, Aura, walk us through a basic guideline or a series of basic guidelines to uh, help plan and run events. A series of basic guidelines, he says. All right, strap yourselves in, kids. This is going to take a while now. Um, so you want to be a TO. That's, that's great. As a prospective tournament organizer, you're going to need a couple of things. You're going to want some other stuff, and they're maybe thinking about prizes and other product support. So let's let's go right down this in order. Uh, so okay. the first thing is you're going to have a handful of needs. Uh, the first of these, most obviously, is interest. Uh, this can span from a few friends that get together every Wednesday night and play a game or two at someone's house, to a playgroup at a local store, all the way up to running a dedicated room for all three days of a convention. Um, personally, I've done this at every level, and I suspect uh, both of you have a fair amount of experience in this as well. Pretty much, yeah. What do you mean I spend all three days at a convention in the CCG room? I wasn't saying anything. I staff conventions now, so I got a different story there. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um... We touched on this earlier. Uh, there are different strategies for attracting players depending on the scale of your event. Uh, social media is insanely popular with marketing departments for a reason. Uh, local pony groups on Facebook, Meetup, whatever. It's all publicity, and publicity is usually good. Um, 
I will absolutely defer to Pirate Dash here because he is much better at this than I am. Facebook has been pretty vital um, for our group. It's Most of our members are on it. We've got a few that aren't, but we still, even though they're not, we'll still like text them or even chat with them on Skype. It's like, hey, come down. This is what we're doing this week. But we, we mainly use our Facebook group as a way to post what's going on, what we're doing each week, what the format might be, or if we got a special event coming up, or – if we're going to go on a quote barnstorming tour again, um, and then we'll use it to organize and figure out what we're doing for that week. Um, and then you just reach, you can reach out to other groups. I know Hey Canterlot is a big one. Um, you can promote there as well. And don't, don't be afraid to just limit yourself to the CCG Facebook groups or Twitter or anything like that. Go ahead and branch out and see if you can get any brony groups interested in it. Um, post on other Reddits. Post where you think you would get some eyes and where you might get an interested party. Uh, and don't be shy about it. Just even if you think you'll get one pair of eyeballs on it. It's more than what you would have done if you hadn't done anything. Very true. Like I said, publicity is good. Get the word out. Uh, now, once you've got some interest, the next thing you're going to need is a timer. And you're sitting there going, a timer? Why? Well, Ideally, you'd have a big screen somewhere visible to the whole room showing the countdown, but you can absolutely make do with your just your phone and the alarm on your phone. You will need an alarm because otherwise you'll forget to check the clock and go over time. But this is important for a tournament setting, one, because it keeps you on schedule, and two, because it's fair to all the decks. There are certain decks that really, really, really don't want to have to, you know, keep up with the clock. And there are other decks that are just like, whatever, I'm going to finish in 20 minutes anyway. And you need to make sure that all matchups have the same amount of time so that you don't have advantageous situations for certain kinds of decks. Cough, uh, chaos control. Cough, any kind of control, cough. I, I or, can point out, to, oh, go ahead. Or in some cases, cough, aggro, cough, because they'll sit there and shoot ahead and then sit there and stall. Judge. Judge. I do know at our store in Peoria, they do have a big screen TV that's uh, poked up to the wall that they'll use as a timer. And you'll find that most game stores will do that nowadays. And if you just ask, they'll be uh, you'll be able to use it. Obviously, if yep. there's a magic tournament running at the same time, they're probably going to take precedence, but... Yeah, that's true. We, that's what we've found in our group for pretty much anything. Magic takes precedence. Like, we've reached to the point where, well, okay, Magic got a pre-release this weekend, so we're not meeting up, because they will take precedence. Because, <laughs> yikes, correct. Yeah, and again, this all comes back to communication as well. Communicate with your local game store, communicate with the store owner, or whoever the event organizer there is. Look at their calendar, either in person or online. See if you're going to be conflicting with anything. Yeah. Pro tip, uh, FNM or Friday Night Magic, they meet on Friday nights. What? Uh, as such, there is generally a fairly large population at the store playing Magic. So probably be a good idea to not uh, schedule your events on Friday nights. Not that you can't, just... Be aware that there's going to be a bunch of Magic players. And you'll typically get more people to show up on a weekend. Like, we meet on Saturdays and Sundays, or Saturdays or Sundays, because we're not working then. Most people aren't working on the weekend, so you'll get a higher chance of people to show up on the weekend. Right. Okay. Now, uh, the other thing you're going to need is some space with some tables and some chairs and a few hours to monopolize them. Time is a more complicated subject, which we'll come back to in a minute, but for most purposes, tables are a little bit easier. Unless it's Friday Night Magic. Unless it's Friday Night Magic. Uh, the tables normally seen at conventions and stores are two and a half feet by six feet. That is, I don't remember what that is in meters, but do the math, I guess. 
Uh, one of those tables can support four players. Sometimes you'll occasionally see eight foot tables, which can support six players. For larger events or crowded stores, cough, Friday Night Magic, cough, it starts to matter how many seats you can get. Uh, related to the first point, you do need to know about how much interest you have. Just because you have 64 seats available at a convention doesn't mean you'll get 64 players for every event. And if you do that, you're probably just wasting space that other people could use if you had that many. Um, That's fair. Yeah. You no one. Go for it. Go ahead. No, you. If you're looking to create a good working relationship with a store, a great way to do that is to ensure that you don't take up more of their resources than you need. Time, money, space, doesn't matter. Right. Uh, even if they are running a magic event, there's probably a couple of tables somewhere off in the corner, or even just a couple of seats that they wouldn't mind you using. Like, the worst case is you go and ask the person at the store, hey, do you have a couple of seats somewhere? No. We're, um... You know, we're full up on magic. Worst they can do is say no. Best they can do is be like, yeah, actually, there's a couple of spots over in the corner. Go, go chill back there. Okay. So okay, think... so table tables and chairs. So lazy boys, right? We can get the full full recliner action going? Mm, un Unviolent. Because you're going to drop a card down into there, and then you're going to recline and bend something expensive. I may have done that before. I may have also. That's not good. Which card did you bend? Do you really want to know? I mean, you may I as well know. say it now. Okay, yeah. well, it wasn't by sitting on it, but it was by not being as careful with my cards as I should have been. The Doctor Who's promo main. Oh my god. Uh, the you... autographed one? Yeah. I put that in a top loader as soon as I got it, and it hasn't left since. I was trying to fit it in a top loader, and I wasn't really looking at what I was doing, and I pushed too hard. Oh my god. Womp womp. It, it physically pains me. I okay. know. So, we've talked about the needs. Now, obviously, you're going to need all of those things. You need interest, and you need ta a place to run your event, and you need a timer so that you can keep things fair and on schedule. Now let's talk about some things that you're going to want. One of the things you're going to want is judges. Ponies are, of course, serious business. Well, actually, not so much, since players in this community are generally nice and just want to have fun. So it's not that huge of a deal. But you will at least want someone who knows the competitive rule or the comprehensive rules and can answer tricky questions involving stuff like trigger order and timing. But you do at least need someone who can play the game without breaking the rules too badly. They Just knowing how to play and getting yourself through a normal game without stumbling and having to ask questions is more than enough here. For some of the tougher questions, or if you need support during a tournament, you can occasionally get help in one of the chat rooms, either Discord, usually. Discord's actually the one I'd suggest at this point. Uh, but at the same time, you shouldn't hold up the game for too long if you need to go and seek outside assistance. Uh, sometimes, as a TO or a head judge, you may need to make a call, even if it's not the right one. But a call needs to be made. Make the call. Make the call. Um, second, you're probably going to want some form of computerized tournament management. Maintaining a tournament bracket and tiebreakers by hand gets infeasible at some point around eight players. Uh, Challenge is free and should work on any smartphone made in the last year or last three years even, or just about any computer. A reliable charged device is important because it's no fun picking up the pieces if it breaks or runs out of battery mid-tournament. As several people can attest to, you really, really, really do not want to be running a tournament by hand. It's it's just 
too annoying. Yeah, plug in, plug in your tournament laptops, folks. Or tablets. Bring a charger, in fact. Or two. I, I've done paper and pencil plenty of times for our group. It, it's not bad. Having that computer backup um, is good. But as I've learned from being a news reporter, you, you want paper and pencil as well as, as a good backup. I've, we've also done paper and pencil in our group because we've also experimented with different tournament formats. Uh, we've done double elimination brackets. Um, we've done this one type called a compass type bracket, uh, where basically everybody plays the same amount of games and it ends up seeding people after. Um, we, we experiment a lot in our group with tournament formats. That's interesting. Yeah, paper and pencil will absolutely work. And you can make it work up to basically as large of a scale as you want, but it is easier if you have a computer. You just do, as I said, need to be prepared for the eventuality that it might break. Right. Okay, so that kind of covers the basic needs of any group, right? Interest, something to track time, tables and space, something to track your software. But now we're into tools that'll be more um, helpful, right? Well, I mean, to some degree, both of those are are wants. You can you can get by without a computer, like I said. You can, to some degree, get by without a judge as long as your players are all reasonably nice and understand what's up. Uh, but let's talk about that one other thing that I mentioned, which is prize and product support. Now, if you want to have prizes or run limited events, you need sealed packs. Ideally, you'd be able to offload this entire problem to your local game store and just be like, hey, can we just give you five bucks for some packs and we'll call it good. Unfortunately, that's becoming harder to do and in the case of a convention, normally just doesn't work there. Uh, for smaller playgroups that want to run limited events and don't have a store to support them, well, Find a store would be great, but if that's unfeasible for whatever reason, pulling resources to and or someone who can just buy a box, which is unsold to the group at cost, is a possible option. Uh, I know there are a couple of groups that do this, and this obviously does scale up to larger volumes of product, but that also means it scales up in terms of the amount of money involved and eventually taxation responsibilities. Pro tip, that's called a business which is what your local game store is. So, <laughs> uh, if you are actually collecting entry fees for things, and especially if this is happening on a larger scale, you do want a way to track who has signed up and paid for what. Uh, you should get names, or if you're at a convention, a badge number to write down as people pay, or give out some kind of reasonable unique token, like, say, a poker chip with a number written on it. Just something to say, oh yes, you've paid for this already. Or, you know, nifty little hand wood-burned tokens. I missed those at Everfree last year. Please bring them back. We'll see. Also, they smelled like hot dogs. Only for a little while. Yeah, it's because they had some time to air out. They smelled a lot more like hot dogs when I made them. Oh, I'm sure. Okay, so that's needs and wants. Let's talk a little bit about some of the events you could run. The most popular ones are constructed events. Constructed events are ones where the players bring their own decks to the tournament. The two important formats here are Harmony and Core. These are very well defined in the official floor rules, but the short summary is Harmony is all cards, minus the banned cards. And Core has a similar rule set with the additional restriction that only the last two blocks, which are Equestrian Odysseys forward, may be used. And it has a different ban list, which is not merely a subset of the one in Harmony, because there are things banned in Core that are not banned in Harmony and vice versa. Um, as I said, this is 
probably one of the most popular formats, but not to overshadow another set of formats, limited. Uh, these are where players build decks out of product they get during the event. Uh, these events generally demand more player skill to build a workable deck, and Draft in particular is not recommended for inexperienced players. It is unfortunately very possible for a player to put themselves in a very disadvantaged position before they even start the first game. What do you mean I have to draft entry? I heard that I don't need resource removal. Pass me all the blue cards. No, you're supposed to pass me all the poppies. Just uh, you can get have some... their waifu. <laughs> you can have poppy as long as I get all the blue cards. That's fine. Um, oh, as Hithrock points out, this is also very dependent on location. My locals is almost exclusively core at this point. Uh, Vancouver, for example, is almost exclusively Harmony. My local group is almost exclusively Nightmare. Well, is it that more related to the players in the group? Possibly. I mean, yes. And no, we're mostly core. Shout out to any of the groups out there that are primarily Nightmare. If you're out there, I want to know. I want to know why you do this. Because he Probably. enjoys rolling in the mud. I, I don't think that was ever really up for question. It's probably a nightmare to put together, though. Uh... Uh... That, was, that was awful. That was, that was pretty Silver Quill worthy. I'll give it a 7 out of 10. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think I'll give it a 7 out of 10. Um, yeah, Limited is very interesting because you can end up with some very unconventional builds and strategies, merely because that's the position that you're stuck in. But at the same time, you can build some really off-the-wall stuff that'll give you ideas for Constructed. Uh, limited decks are 30-card minimum draw deck, 5-card minimum problem deck. There is no ban list whatsoever. Hush, Grandpa's, I know you're overjoyed at that. And it's also legal to run any number of a copy of a card. Also, Hush, I know you're also happy about that. What was that about nine penny lanes again? I, I believe what you meant to say was nine copies of Guidance Counselor. I, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, in some limited formats, the TO may choose to allow certain additional cards, such as the common or uncommon mains and wild wild problems with no abilities to be added from outside a player's limited pool. These are necessary because if you don't pull a main, well, you kind of need one to play the game, and if you don't pull enough problems, well, you kind of need five of those to play the game as well. Uh, one thing that I will note there is you should, if at all possible, be prepared with those for players when they need them. Because otherwise yep. you're going to be stuck sitting there with a Sharpie and some tape trying to quickly make a bunch of proxies of um, searching high and low or whatever. Uh, the you can also choose to allow additional problems, such as the wild wild problems with abilities, a different or larger set of mains. Uh, one small note here is if you do allow the Cutie Mark Crusaders mains, uh, Scoots is going to wreck things. So I would generally suggest not allowing the Cutie Mark Crusaders mains. Or just specifically not Scootaloo. Most players will agree that she is much more powerful and limited than she needs to be. Yes. You can make a blue main deck with... What are the other two colors I pulled my pool? Okay, whatever. We'll be fine. And you actually will be fine. That's how powerful she is. Um, or potentially also including a small number of entry friends from outside their pool. As I mentioned, for any cards that you choose to allow this way, you absolutely want either copies or proxies available for players. Now, uh, let's talk about a couple of the formats that you might see in Limited. 
Uh, draft is a format where players start out with four packs and open them from newest to oldest. When a player opens a pack, they choose a card, then pass the remaining cards to an adjacent player. And they continue passing cards until they run out of cards to pass. Then another pack is opened and the cards are passed the other way, and so on and so forth. Uh, the deck that the player uh, makes is then built out of those 48 cards plus whatever proxies are provided by the tournament organizer. This is somewhat hard for new players, as I mentioned earlier, but for players who can build decks and are at least decent at seeing how a deck would come together, this is a lot of fun. The Seattle locals used to run drafts every other weekend, and I attribute a large amount of my deck building ability to the fact that we were doing that. I actually will second that. That definitely helped me get a lot better at deck building when I was there. Yeah, draft was a ton of fun when we ran it back, even in uh, Premier Canterlot Knights era. Um, it was it was great. I don't know what you're talking about. That was like the best draft format. That's what I'm saying. It was good. I liked it. No, that format specifically was the best draft format. Because I'm a terrible person and figured out that Swift on a main is really, really good. And just I... forced blue-pink every single time. Ah, I forced Royal Guidance every single time. I usually just did Troublemaker Control. Well, good news for you, Echo, in chat. I see that you say you've always been a fan of Sealed, personally. I can, I can sympathize with that. I don't know if that would be sympathy. I can agree with that, is probably the better term. And you know what makes Sealed even better? Chucking another two people involved. Which gives the, us the, I was going to say memes. Which gives us the, the best format, which is Meme Sealed. Yes! This is Wait. where... You take three people and give them even more packs, but then tell them that they need to make multiple decks. So the setup that we've seen most often is a team of three getting 16 packs. And each player in a team is assigned a letter, A, B, or C, and plays a game against the corresponding player on another team. The, the games themselves don't interact, but the players can help each other. And obviously the team with the most wins takes the round. So I've been in positions where my game finished early because I either just got horribly dunked on or whatever, and I was able to go over to a teammate and sit there and then essentially two-on-one their opponent because you have twice the brain power working against one person. And I know, I'm pretty sure all three of you have had some experience playing in this, and it's basically the best format. Oh yeah. It's a fantastic format, especially when you are inevitably that one person where you're like, all right, what does everyone want to build? And then before you can answer, each of the other two people answers and claims like half the card pool, and so you're left with just the dregs. And you're like, well, time to try to go neutral. See, but that's when you get the really weird decks because you're going to sit there and come up with... Orange-yellow tokens. Something incredibly bizarre. Yeah, how many snakes did Pinky have? Oh, I wish he was here right now. Uh, 30 something? 30 something. 30 yeah. something snakes? I, that's a lot of snakes. Like, so many snakes. I feel bad that we didn't get a chance to play you guys in Team Sealed at Continentals two years ago. Because I think we could have had a pretty good match. Was that when, was that when we were Team Honk? Was that the Continentals you're talking about? I don't know. Possibly. Hey, Pinky, how many snakes did you make? Oh, apparently he's not actually here. He's kind of here, but he's not actually here. Rip. I think I remember it being like 32. It was over 30. It was, it was some snakes. crazy amount. Yeah, Team Sealed is a ton of fun. Uh, it is 100% my favorite limited environment. Um, it's just such a blast, and it's one of the reasons why Commentary as Magic runs it at just about every convention that we can. 
If you are attending a convention where we are hosting events and it's not something major like Continentals, um, there's probably going to be Team Sealed there. So no Team Sealed at Cider Fest? Don't have time, unfortunately. Continentals is taking two days. And we're sharing the space with the tabletop game room, so we just can't dedicate that amount of space across the entire weekend. With more planning for future years, we can hopefully do it. In the past, Continentals have been run at Gen Con, which is a four-day event. And that fourth day opens up some possibilities. You know what else is four days next year? All the cons so far? Yeah, yeah so pretty far. much. Pretty much. <laughs> Now, I couldn't help but notice that you did neglect one up-and-coming constructed format. What? Are you going to throw Beyond Block out there? No, I'm not going to throw Beyond Block out there, but I, d I would like to at least mention Popper. The unsung hero of the CCG. Have you ever sat there playing a game and looking at your opponent's board with promos and ultra rares everywhere and three sticks in play somehow simultaneously because they're cheating and just going man this is really unfair i wish we could play with cards that were a little bit more balanced well i've got the answer to you it's popper popper is a format where you are allowed to play with commons uncommons and fixed cards only no rares, no super rares, no ultra rares, no royal rares, and no exclusive promos. So all those villain farming decks, gone. What, what villains do you have to farm? Ha ha ha. All those Bluna hotwing decks, gone. Gas control? It's a darn shame that Dr. Hooves is a rare, huh? Mm-hmm. And so is Selena Blue. I'm actually going to be making a post here on Reddit in the next couple days, um, sharing a couple of popper deck ideas for people who are looking to get started, because that will be one of the events we can run at Ciderfest this year. We'll be running that on Friday. Hmm. Okay. And then I'll give a shout out to Nightmare as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Nightmare. I don't know, we might have to have another one of those soon, but... Nightmare is a very special format for very... Nightmare is a format for BabsCon at 11 o'clock in the morning. Or 11 o'clock at night. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, now, we've talked about a lot of stuff, but as I mentioned earlier, we were going to leave time for later. Uh, during a given event, you're going to need about 15 minutes at the start due to players showing up late, needing to explain things to players, and other just assorted housekeeping. You essentially need to plan on this happening because it's going to happen. Limited events will also take additional time at the start, usually about a round's worth, in order for the players to build their decks. Now, I talked about a round here, and how long does a round take? Well, to players, a Swiss round is 35 minutes. You as the TO, however, are skeptical because that is a dirty, dirty lie. In fact, it's almost to the level of statistics. From an event perspective, a 35-minute round actually takes 45 minutes. The extra 10 minutes are spent doing end-of-round turns, getting match results, uh, seating for the next round, assorted housekeeping, running to the bathroom, whatever. But it's going to take longer than 35 minutes. That one combo player who actually runs to the full 5-minute hard timer because their turn is taking forever... Cough. Cough. Whatever reason it may be. Yeah. Uh, so the suggestion I have here is figure out how many seats you have and how much time you have, and then figure out which of those two things is your limiting factor. If you end up only having about three hours, well, that's probably going to be your limiting factor. On the other hand, if you only have, you know, four seats, that's going to be your limiting factor, regardless of how much time or players you have in the other case. Uh, depending on whether or not you are limited by seating, 
or time, you should either consider running fewer rounds if limited by seating, or perhaps accepting more players if limited by time. Uh, the floor rules have guidelines for how many rounds you should have for a given number of players. They are guidelines, so you can tinker with them a little bit, but at the same time, don't go more than a round in either direction. Three to five round tournaments are ideal. If you go long, people get tired. If you go short, well, people just start to get into it, and then it ends. Both of those things are bad. Cue the um, nine-round slog fest at Continentals. Ugh. Those are always an endurance challenge. Now, see, Stress was... test for all players involved. Now, See, I was smart, and I brought snacks. So I'm sitting there at the table kind of nibbling on something, and by the end of it, I'm like the only person who's actually lucid. Everyone else is in the food, like, days. I need days. food, I need water. <laughs> Coma? I need, yeah. yeah. Thankfully, when we did that again in 2016, we had a lunch break. Yes. Okay. Um, Hithrock asks, is it okay for a TO to participate in the tournament? At smaller scales, essentially, you'd be sitting out the whole time, so I don't personally see an issue with this. I believe the official guidance is it's somewhere around... What, what does magic do for this? I think it's as soon as the, the, the counter goes over about 16 that you need to have a dedicated TO. Correct. Or if the uh, competitive level of the event exceeds a certain level. Right. And seeing as MLP doesn't have a competitive level, well, somewhere around 16 people seems like the point where you'd have enough overhead that you need someone to sit out and either judge slash manage the tournament. Right. 16 people can generally be managed by a single TO for regular meetups. We would get in the teens. Um, at the start of our group's uh, activity in Fresno, and that's easily fine for one person to handle, provided that you give yourself the tools, the wants and the needs that we just finished talking about. If you're not organized and you try to pin that all on one person, if you don't make sure that you get there ahead of time and set things up and make sure you've got everything laid out, it will be a disaster. I know when I was running uh, as a TO for our store championships and regionals, one thing that helped me, we had the computer that was running the event, but uh, to kind of help make things go more smoothly, I had one dedicated spot where if you had to play me in a match, you had to come over to me just so I can keep things organized and so not I'm not running around all over the place and not having to go back to the computer every minute or so to update results and such, so... Yes, if you are TOing, you should pick a spot and camp there, and that's your table number. It's yours. Now, what happens if you're running multiple events over the course of a day? Like, let's say that there's a local convention, and you want to plan events for this con. Well, that is a slightly more complicated topic that is going to take more time. Now we have, as I mentioned earlier, a 5,000 word long document that covers most of this stuff in far more detail because I'm going to be honest here, listening to a video for this info, not the greatest. So, yeah. written document. We'll link that later though. Actually. Um, oh, I do have a little note here. So, if you have more time in a shared room or you end up owning your own room, then you should come up with a bigger list of events. This is, as I said, a longer topic that the treatise goes over in detail, but there are two key things to remember. First, it takes time to switch between events. Second, people need breaks. And third, events like this list will run long. You see what I did there? That was kind of terrible. <laughs> um, you should leave at least half an hour between events don't run events late into the night, and don't start them at the crack of dawn. You're going to want to get eight hours of sleep. You're not going to, but you're going to want to. So, don't start yourself off on the wrong foot. 621 is an important rule. Right. And we've covered that elsewhere. Yes, we have. 
now, on our convention primer. Uh, one last thing that I want to go over is actually running the events. After all that planning, and I, I refuse to make a Twilight joke here because this is difficult, it's time to actually run the events. Now, here's a small collection of tips from people who have been doing this for longer than we probably should have. Uh, first, remember to actually start your timers at the beginning of round, and as Pirate Dash mentioned, you should probably write that down somewhere as well, just in case your timer breaks. Uh, players would generally prefer a five-minute warning over just being like, surprise, it's the end of the game. So call a five-minute warning if you remember. Uh, when you call time in round, you are always going to need to explain the end of round procedures because nobody remembers them. Uh, when you call time and warnings, you need to do it loud and you need to do it multiple times because people tend to not hear them. You may need to go around to the point of individually talking to each table. Uh, if you have or are collecting deck lists for the events, do try to inspect them for correctness as you can, uh, because players will tend to write things like Luna and not include a subtitle to uniquely identify the card. Do keep in mind that if you are participating in an event, you need to not actually look at the deck lists during or before the event, because that gives you as the TO an unfair advantage. Uh, also, if you have prize support or product support for events, you should lay that out ahead of time. If you have to sit there and build a sealed kit for each player as they are, or as you're trying to start the event, that's going to take a while. So build that stuff ahead of time. And that was 2,000 words of ranting. You done good. Plan for everything is the short version. Pretty much. Yeah, that's the TLDR. Make, like, you need to sit there and just be like, I'm doing Twilight Sparkle proud. Look at all these plans and checklists that I've triple checked. It's your greatest work. All right, so this episode took kind of more of a podcast feel since there's not a lot of visuals to go with it. But as Ara said, there is a document um, that goes into a lot of these topics even more in depth than we did here that can serve as kind of a guidebook. And I believe we're going to link that and make it available for people to read at their convenience, yes? Just as soon as I can figure out where I put it. Okay. My browser windows are all over the place. What were we just saying about planning for everything? Ponies. What? How many browser windows do you have open, Aura? Uh, windows? Four. Tabs? I, you don't want me to take the time to count. Okay. 70. I'll wait. It's over 100. If I can make one brief note for TOs, just a small thing. Um, one thing we always do with our events, take pictures and post them to your group to show people that you're having fun and to show people that there are actually people playing the game. That's another great way to promote your group. That's an excellent point. You know, we were scrambling to try to find uh, photos for the promotion of Continentals this year at Ciderfest, and I just happened to come across that photo of people playing at, uh, what was it, Pacific PonyCon? That was Pacific PonyCon... 2016? Yeah, 2016. Rest uh, in peace. It's, it was a surprisingly really useful photo for us, and I wish we had more. And I'm sure we'll be taking more. Hi, I'm incredibly rare. Yes, that was... That was that con. Channel your inner f-stop. Or don't, he's banned. Wasted. Uh... Press F. F. Wow. Alright. Well... Thank you, everyone, for sticking with us this whole time. Uh, we do actually have one other uh, T.O. who kind of snuck in here. Let's see if he's still here now. Pinky. Hey. Hey, Pinky. How's hey. it going? Hey, it's going well. Hey, how many snakes did you make? I think it was like 32 or something like that, but I remember they all got minus one power because of some of it. <laughs> I was right. I knew it was 32. Through the ages. 
Yep. Uh, but they were still there in spirit. Rip snakes. Rip. F. Pinky, do you have uh, a, any last minute advice or tips for aspiring TOs or event organizers? Uh, one thing I would mention is that not every single week needs to be event. Sometime casual play is just also fine as well. I'm not sure if you guys already mentioned that as well, but you definitely want to have some events, but there are some weeks that maybe you just don't have enough people for an event. You can, there's still plenty of space for a casual play to be a perfectly viable option. That's a great point. Events can create a lot of stress and do require planning. If you're not feeling up to it at a weekly regularity or something like that, but you still want the chance to play and maybe make something more accessible to newer players so they can just kind of jump in or you can run demos, open play or free play can be a great thing to do. Yeah. Good. Even, at, even at a convention that's actually valuable, just having a little bit of time where it's like dedicated open play for the game. No events, just come and have a game. And a chance for all the TOs to sneak out and grab a meal. Yes. <laughs> yeah, good tip. Well, I think that's actually going to about wrap up our uh, our discussion on the topic of how to tournament. Did we get through the whole thing in I one part? I think we actually got through the whole thing in one part, so that wasn't kind according of. to plan. But hey, it works. I'm impressed. Hooray. Hur hooray, indeed. Woo. Uh, we would like to give a big shout out to all of our patrons on Patreon. Thank you so much for your regular support. And if you aren't currently a patron and you enjoy what we do, please consider donating, because doing so will give you some awesome rewards like the ability to vote on polls to determine what future videos we produce, a chance to share your own deck creations to be reviewed live, and even the ability to challenge members of Sim or other patrons to feature duels using some wacky rules. If you have comments or questions you'd like to send our way, or if you're just interested in hearing about what we're working on for the future, there are many ways you can stay in contact. We have our Patreon, as mentioned previously, but we also have a Facebook page, facebook.com slash commentariasmagic. We're on Twitter, at CIM underscore CCG. You can email us at commentariasmagicteam at gmail.com. And patrons at or above the $5 per month level get access to our Slack channel, where you can chat live with us any day, anytime. Ara, you and I were both up till 5 a.m. on it, Saturday? It was light again when I went to bed. Yes. You will find someone away. Of course, it helps that we have Hithrock in there, too. The if secret you're... is no one sleeps. This is the secret. Combo never sleeps. Combo happens at 2 a.m. If you're exactly. operated. It's true, it's combo o'clock. If you're looking to watch any of our previous videos, including tournament recordings, you can find them on our YouTube channel, which is linked in the sidebar, and please make sure to subscribe while you're there so we can have a channel URL that's a little easier to remember. But with all that said, thank you so much, Pinky, Ivory, Pirate Dash, for joining us for this stream. Thank you for having us. Of yeah, course. Here. Thank you so much. Hopefully we'll see several of you at Continentals if you have the chance, or at future events beyond that. You might see me at Continentals, or you'll see me running around dead, but tired again. <laughs> Fair. Possibly. Uh, we po yes, why not both? Gotta run it by the con chair first. <laughs> We'd also like to thank our viewers both here now and watching this recording later. Uh, we are, as always, Commentary as Magic. I am, as always, Grand Paws. Our cat, and special guests. Pirate Dash. Ivory Starlight. Thank you. And we'll see you all in two weeks. Yep. Bye-bye. See ya. Later.